right. Hello, everybody. Um, this is Emma Yalanen from the Finnish British Chamber of Commerce. Um, on behalf of ourselves, the Norwegian Chamber of Commerce and the Danish UK Association, I would like to welcome you all to this webinar um, on the legal implications of COVID-19 on your UK business, hosted together with our member Gowling. Um, if you have any issues with your audio, um, please first remember to check your own internet connection and your audio settings. Um, and if there's still some issues, please let us know in the chat function that you can see on the bottom of your screen. Um, we will be doing a Q&A at the end. So during the presentations, um, please feel free to ask your questions. You can send those in through the Q&A box at the bottom. And please make sure that you actually send your questions that you want answered through the Q&A instead of the chat function. Um, and then this webinar will cover, um, first off, we will have Jonathan Chamberlain from Gowling um, covering the topic, how UK employers can deal with the special circumstances. Um, next up, we'll have Amber Strickland talking about how employers can discharge their duties to protect the health and safety of employees who are working from home and those who cannot work from home. And then finally, we'll have Julian Pallet talking about directors' duties in these testing times. And um, now I'm hoping most of our attendees will have joined us, so I will pass on um, the the mic to. Jonathan to start us off. Thank you. I'll just give it a second for my slide, my one and only slide, you'll be pleased to hear to load. Good. I'm going to be talking about three things about the scheme. What are the basics? Uh, I suspect that you'll be familiar with those by now, but I think it's worth just recapping so we know what it is we're talking about. Then we're gonna move on to what are the key things that uh, you as an employer need to do to take advantage of this scheme. And then uh, let's talk about the issues that, that we as a law firm are seeing coming out of this in practice. And since it's been announced, uh, I can say that this is about 70% of the work that the team here are doing is around queries coming out of this scheme. And the reason for that, going back to the first point and, and looking at the basics, is, is this. We're all looking at this from the perspective of, of our employees. What does it mean uh, for them? Really, what this is, is a, a tax reimbursement scheme or a rebate scheme, effectively. Uh, what the government have announced is uh, how employers can claim money from the government and what they can claim. They've largely left silent as to what then happens to employees, save that any money that you claim uh, from the government has to have been spent on employees it has to be a wash through you're not going to take a cut on the way through but other than that what actually happens to employees in all of this um uh have been left to the basics of the the existing law and, and not uh the, the new scheme and the second point that I, I i want to make is that we're all working off hmrc guidance the rules haven't been published yet so we don't know what the fine points of detail of this scheme are going to be. We can see the direction of travel. We can see what the guidance says. We think it's going to be very difficult for HMRC in the uh, months, weeks to come when hopefully all this has passed and, and businesses are still claiming money back from the government for HMRC to turn around and say, well, you're not having it because of this small print in the regulations. If that contradicts the guidance, we're rather expecting the courts to, to, to take a view that, look, you told businesses they were going to get this money, they're going to get this money. But it does mean that, that, that quite a bit of the detail, even of the, the, the reimbursement element of the scheme, hasn't yet been worked out. So with those two points in mind, uh, what does the scheme actually involve? Well, the, the outline, I think, is, is now very well known. 
because the, the headline point is that the government will reimburse employers up to 80% of an employee's remuneration, we'll come back to in a moment how you calculate what the remuneration is, up to a monthly maximum of two and a half thousand pounds plus employers' national insurance contributions plus the minimum pension contributions under auto enrollment. So 80% uh, or two and a half thousand, uh, whichever is, is the lower. And that's a number that's obviously been calculated to cover uh, most of the income for most of the workforce of, of the UK. It's obviously um, not going to compensate higher earners, but, but your average Joe is going to see most of their income preserved by virtue of this scheme if they're in work. Because that brings me to the next um, point about the basics. This, of course, applies to people who are in work. There's a separate scheme for the self-employed, which interestingly is not in some aspects nearly as generous, but we're not talking about that today. And the reason uh, 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 why it's for those um, in work is comes back to what I was saying about this, this being run <laughs> through HMRC and, 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 and through the tax system. Essentially, if you've got a PAYE code for somebody, then they qualify as an employee under this scheme. They, we're, we're, they get, they're not really concerned with the difference between um, uh, employees and workers and all that sort of stuff, those employment classification issues. If there's a PAYE code, you can claim, and if there isn't, then you may not be able to. Probably can't. Um, the only reason I'm sounding hesitant is that, as we'll see when we talk about issues are coming out in practice, we've been asked questions about secondments and things like that, which I'll, I'll touch on at the end. So if that's what the, the, the fundamental um, structure looks like, then what are the key things that employers must do to take advantage of the scheme? Well, let's step back a moment here if we can. Remember what I said that this scheme is uh, uh, primarily about issues between or money flowing from government to the employer. It's largely left unsaid what happens to the relationship between employer and employee. So um, we've been positioning furlough in terms that this is good news. You know, you might otherwise be made redundant, but you, 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 know, you can go down this thing called furlough and you'll keep 80% of your income up to the cap, etc. Well, just, just imagine how if in normal circumstances you were going to an employee and you were going to say, actually, you're now only going to be paid 80% of your income up to the cap and you're not going to have any work to do. Now, we'd all recognise that uh, immediately as a, a breach of employment law, giving the employee certain rights. Um, if you say to somebody you're only going to get 80% of your pay, they can walk. Or if they stay, they can uh, bring claims for breach of contract or more likely, um, in, in this scenario, unlawful deduction from wages. And they can just sit and wait whilst those unlawful deductions rack up. And at the end, when we're all going back to work normally, God willing, three months, four months, five months, however long it takes, then they'll just put in their claim form and say, give me all my back wages now, please. Which means that the key thing that you have to do here to take advantage of this scheme is get the agreement of the employee. I mean, first, you should check their contract to see whether you've got the right to do this, but unless you are uh, a large manufacturing company whose roots go back to the 1960s and 70s, and that's when you first started drafting your contracts of employment, I can pretty much guarantee that you won't have that right. Because layoff. and and big manufacturers would do that if there's a downturn in order, then, then people be laid off from the production line. But we haven't seen that sort of thing being written in contracts for 30 years or more. There are some historic ones where it still continues, um, but I, 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 I'll eat my hat if it's in, in the contracts of, of, of many of the people who are uh, uh, listening here today. So that means that you need to reach agreement with the employee. Now, in most cases, when it's clear that the alternative to this is uh, redundancy, then uh, what's going to happen is you're, you're going to get acceptances. Um, but that's not guaranteed. So one of the things that, that for example, it's been in the news recently is that British Airways is putting 30,000 people on furlough 
but it's reached a separate deal with its pilots that they're going to be kept on 50% of their pay. Um, and that's their actual pay, not the, the capped amount. So uh, uh, that's an example of an employer topping up the scheme. And, and we know from our earlier webinar that we did on this uh, in the week when we did a survey of those attending, that a sizable proportion, not the majority by any means, still a minority, but a sizable proportion of employers are planning on topping up these payments to, to the, the actual amount, presumably to make it easier for employees to, to agree to going. Um, if you can't get agreement, and it's a question of either you go on furlough or uh, we make you redundant, um, and you want to put people compulsorily on, on furlough, um, then you would be looking at going through a similar exercise as you would to a redundancy. Um, which means uh, choosing the right people, going through a process of consultation. Now, clearly, in current circumstances, you can accelerate that, but the basic requirements still remain. So that's something you'll need to think very carefully about. So if I said one of the two key things that here, that the real takeaways from this is consult with your workforce about what it is that you're doing, and then when you've got the agreement of individual employees, make sure that you document it. OK, because if later down the line, at the moment, HMRC is saying we're going to give you lots of money here, you are, have lots of money. And everybody's thinking this is a, a scheme to, 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 to keep the economy going and HMRC are going to be generous. Um, uh, uh, and that's great. Um, uh, I don't trust the taxman as far as I can spit. And I just think that, that by the time this all settles down, they might be looking to try and get out of some of the payments. So let's make sure that the agreement is documented that you can say to HMRC, this employee was on furlough. We were not paying um, them except furlough money. And crucially, and this is a crucial point, they were not doing any work for us. None, nada, nothing. Um, so that brings me on to my third point. What issues are we seeing here uh, uh, coming out in practice? Well, let's start with that one. Um, can employees do any work whilst they're on furlough? No, not for you, they can't. Um, they can be in the loop as far as workplace communications are concerned. That's a question we've been asked. We, you know, we send our emails to our people. Can we still keep them on the list? Can we let them know what's happening? Yes, you can. What you can't do is oblige them to look at them. You can't oblige them to do anything. If they choose to look at them, that's fine. That's their business. But it's a matter of choice for them. And again, that's something you should document in your further agreement. We will be sending you communications to keep you in touch, but you are not obliged to look at them. So it's quite clear that, that they're not being kept on standby so that they can be, be called in. Another thing that, we, we're, that, that, that is coming out, can you furlough people part time? No, we, we want to people, put people on um, uh, 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 just working in the mornings or just working in the afternoons? Can we claim for the rest of their remuneration? And the answer to that is no. Um, once people are on furlough, uh, they can't do any work for you. They're, they're, the furlough has to be full time as far as the hours they worked for you are concerned. What you can do, we think, is rotate. So a period of furlough has to be a minimum of three weeks. Um, so it seems to us that there's no reason in principle why you can't, if you want to, if you've still got operations ongoing, say, OK, this group of employees, you're on furlough now for these three weeks, and then you'll come back to work for three weeks whilst another group goes on furlough. So you could do that. You could rotate on a three week basis, but you can't do it part time. Another issue. Can employees do any work during this period? Well, as I say, it's absolutely clear that they can't do work for you. It's not so clear that they can't do work for anyone else. It looks like, under the guidance, that that is permitted. Um, but uh, uh, the position may change when the regulations are actually published. We just don't know. So we are advising people to be cautious about this. Again, I come back to the furlough agreement. Uh, you should say in there, you can't work for anybody else without telling us and us giving uh, uh, you our permission 
and you coming back to work when we ask you to come back to work. Um, so we had a situation where an airport um, contacted us and they said, well, you know, there's lots of people that we don't need because there aren't any flights coming, but the local police would really like to employ them because they've all had the relevant criminal records database check. So they're easily employable by the police. Is it a problem if we go and let them work for the police? And we took the pragmatic view, well, this is a socially good thing, um, but make sure there's a clause in the furlough agreement that if the regulations say this can't happen, then you can put it to a stop then. And you're in quite a strong position then to argue with HMRC over any monies that have already been paid. So just be careful around that, I think is 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 what we we'd say but clearly if people are getting chance of a delivery job or a supermarket job or or, or please an nhs job um then we don't really want to stop them from uh, from taking it if we can avoid it and then um i think the last point that i want to, to touch on for my start is what should we be paying people because of course a lot of people's remuneration rate varies so what are we talking about 80 percent of what um and it's pretty clear that it's 80% of what you were paying them on the 28th of February, because that's the cutoff date for this scheme. Um, uh, uh, that's when, if somebody was um, in employment on that date, they can be furloughed, even if you subsequently made them redundant because of COVID. Um, and now this has come in, you can hire them back and reef and, and then furlough them straight away. What you can't do is rehire somebody, which is where the issue around secondments has come. Because people say, well, we've got people overseas and we want to bring them back because there's no work for them uh, for them there. But if you do that, then they come back onto your payroll, quite possibly. And once they've got a new, their, their POE code says after 28th of February, you're not going to be able to claim for them. So they may have to furlough in the countries um, uh, that they're in. But what remuneration they get is what they were getting on the 28th of February. If that's variable, then you average it out over the previous 12 months if they were with you for 12 months, um, uh, or if they only joined you um, uh, since the, the beginning of February, say, then you prorate it over that period. So those are some of the issues that are coming out of this. Uh, but when we did a webinar on this uh, earlier this week, um, and we did the whole webinar on the, 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 the this job retention furlough scheme. Um, we had 140 questions from delegates. Now we were able to group those, um, uh, but but even so, um, it's Im impossible to deal with everything that's coming up in this in this uh, whistle stop tour. But I hope that gives you an, an, uh, an, an outline and highlights some of the, the, the main things. And if there's one takeaway that I want to leave you with here, it's this. Get your furlough agreements um, uh, properly drafted, reviewed, and make them as watertight as possible. Thanks. Thanks, Jonathan. So just moving on to the next part of the webinar, which relates to health and safety. So in these unprecedented circumstances, there will be a number of legal and practical issues for businesses to deal with. Jonathan's just gone through one of the biggest ones at the moment. But health and safety of employees should remain a top priority. How employers treat their employees now will have a lasting impact on morale and loyalty amongst the workforce and it could also impact on the brand image. This section of the webinar focuses on the employer's health and safety duty to those employees who suddenly find themselves working from home for a long period of time, or those who are unable to work from home and are still required to attend at their place of work. I'll consider some of the practical steps employers should be taking to ensure that they discharge their duties and the adjustments which employers can make to keep their employees safe in light of the increased risk to both physical and mental health. So what are employers required to do? This is the legal bit, so bear with me. Employers have a duty to protect the health, safety and welfare of their employees and other people who may be affected by their business. These duties are enshrined in legislation and in common law. Failure to discharge these duties could lead to, among other things, criminal prosecution or a civil claim by employees. So in practice, this means employers making sure that their employees 
and others who are affected by their business in some way are protected from anything that may cause harm. They must do whatever is reasonably practicable to achieve this. In reality, there is nothing special about COVID-19. It is just a risk which now exists. The legal duty in this respect is exactly the same as it was before. Employers have a duty to do a risk assessment in relation to each of the activities that employees undertake. And that risk assessment needs to cover the additional risk associated with COVID-19. Employers still have a duty to ensure, so far as is reasonably practicable, that employees are not exposed to the risk associated with COVID-19. These risk assessments should be kept under review as the position changes. So how can employers discharge their duties when employees are working from home? Employers may well have identified that there is a risk of catching the illness when commuting into the office and when coming into close contact with colleagues in the office. And as such, they may have asked their office-based employees to work from home. And indeed, the UK government guidance now requires that those who can work from home do work from home. However, changing the way that employees work because of the COVID-19 risk will introduce new risks which weren't there before. So for example, prolonged periods of working from home could introduce risks of work-related upper limb disorders. The working from home activities need to be assessed in the same way as other work-related activities. So as a minimum, employers should carry out a risk assessment to identify what could cause injury or illness to employees working from home, that's a hazard, decide how likely it is that someone could be harmed and how seriously, that's the risk, and then take action to eliminate the hazard, or if this isn't possible, to control the risk. The employer does not have to attend each employee's home to carry out the initial risk assessment and any follow-up risk assessment required. Instead, the risk assessment can be conducted by the employee from home. A home working risk assessment should check whether the home worker's place of work is suitable. Much work carried out at home is going to be low risk, office type work. So any risk assessment will need to be tailored accordingly. It will need to consider things like whether the employee has enough light to work and the temperature of the room, whether the employee is set up on a flat surface with sufficient space to work comfortably, whether the fire alarm or smoke detector is working correctly and whether flammable materials are being kept near an ignition source whether home sockets and electrics are in good working order, if employees are using electrical equipment provided by the employer as part of their work, the employer is responsible for its maintenance. Employees should check company equipment regularly to ensure that it is safe for use, i.e. it doesn't have any obvious defects, and that it is kept in a safe condition that will not cause any harm to employees or others. Finally, the employer's policy on VDU use should still apply when the employee is working from home. Actions which can be taken to eliminate certain hazards or at least reduce the risk include ensuring that employees know to take regular breaks and giving them the opportunity to do so. For those at risk of experiencing muscular pains, ensuring that support equipment is provided like wrist support. And if there is only one suitable workspace in the home and more than one person using it, the employee should be encouraged to take it in turns to use that workspace. And employers should consider speaking to them about how they can adapt their day-to-day -day tasks to accommodate this. So what about those who can't work from home? Not all employees will be able to work from home because of the nature of their job. They might be working on a food production line or as part of an essential supply chain. If this is the case, in addition to the usual risk assessment which has been conducted in order to assess the risks in the workplace, employers will need to consider adapting their policies and procedures to incorporate increased control measures to deal with the risks of COVID-19. The measures which employers take will depend on the risks identified, but they might include providing extra PPE, ensuring that employees are working two metres apart where possible, 
temperature checking employees on arrival at the workplace, making sure employees avoid non-essential travel, avoiding large meetings and relying on VidCon and other technology, allowing employees to stagger commuting times if possible. This may mean shifting working hours to start or end either early or later than usual to avoid the busiest and most crowded times on public transport. Keep in mind though, that the changes which are made might introduce new risks which weren't there before. Like if employees are required to keep two meters apart, can they still do their job safely? Especially if this requires being close together to, for example, lift or maneuver machinery or heavy objects. As always, keep these risk assessments under review and update them if anything changes in line with government advice and or changes in the situation. So what about the mental well-being of your employees? Employers also have a duty to protect employees' physical and mental health. Your updated risk assessments will most likely have highlighted risks to employees' mental health arising out of these extraordinary circumstances. Working from home whilst also looking after children of school age or working from home with other householders who are doing the same. Working from home alone, and or working from home with far too much to do or too little to keep the employee occupied. Normal routines will likely no longer exist and employees may find that the boundaries between work life and home life are almost non-existent, giving a whole new meaning to the challenges of achieving work-life balance. The reality is that these factors, together with the feelings of isolation and anxiety and distractions of what is happening globally, which may well ensue, are likely to have a negative impact on employees' mental health and productivity. For those employees who are not able to work from home, they may be facing other strains on their mental health, like increased worry about their or their family's safety. Employers also need to take steps to identify the hazards and manage the risks as far as is reasonably practicable. Communication at this time will be key. Employers should keep employees up to date on how the situation is impacting the business and how they are taking steps to manage the situation. It should be consistent, honest, and as clear as possible. Ideally, there would be a central hub where information and tips on well-being and staying connected are stored, and a point of contact whom employees can approach if they have any concerns. Aside from formal comms, also, don't forget to encourage speaking in general. In the office, we might chat while we're making a cup of tea or just whilst walking past a colleague. We can't replicate that so easily in the world of social distancing, but a call to someone who you haven't spoken to for a while may go a long way. Remember also that one size does not fit all and what works for one employee may not work for another. Risk assessments should identify individual needs. It can be as straightforward as line managers or supervisors speaking with employees about how they are feeling, what their needs are, and what the employer can do to help. You should also identify and protect those that are most at risk. Some employees will find these circumstances more difficult than others. These include employees who are new to the business, those employees who are not used to working from home, employees who used to have a thriving social life with their colleagues and otherwise, and employees who live alone. Some employees may not have easy access to suitable equipment or a good environment to work from home. Special care should be taken to consider and address, as far as is reasonably practicable, the concerns of this particular employee. Finally, I thought it would be helpful to let you know some of the practical ways that we at Gowling have been trying to look after each other's mental health. We don't have time to go through all of these, but some specific examples are, our team leaders have been telling stories of what has gone well and what has been going not so well in the brave new world. Stories about dogs and children going crazy during conference calls can help to boost confidence of juniors, reduce feelings of isolation and normalize problems as much as possible so that we feel like we are all in the same boat. We've provided employees with practical tips about relevant issues like how to manage anxiety, how to stay active and tactics to promote healthy sleep. There are plenty of blogs and videos about these on the internet. 
We have also set up pastoral sub-teams and buddy systems so that employees are being contacted regularly by managers or their peers for a quick chat and to share any problems. So in summary, really, the overall position is that you need to continue with your risk assessment in light of the new risk of COVID-19 and you need to keep these risk assessments up to date, taking into account the physical and mental implications of this new risk. So just to pass on to Julian now. Thank you, Amber. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm, I'm sitting here thinking that I'm probably sitting in a bad posture, in a bad light, feeling very lonely. Um, so <laughs> it's, it's a very strange time. Um, I'm going to talk this afternoon about duties of directors in the UK. Um, healthcare workers on the front line at the moment fighting COVID-19, but directors have got an equally important task, and that's keeping the wheels turning and helping to minimise the damage to the economy the livelihoods of their employees and also trying to keep otherwise viable businesses in check um, for when the crisis passes. Um, directors in the UK have a wide range of duties under um, statute and regulation and Amber and Jonathan have talked about some of those already but of course directors also have statutory duties and common law duties in their capacity as officers of the company. Um, in particular, they have a general duty to promote the success of the company for the ben benefit of its members generally, um, but they also have to look at a, a non-exhaustive list of other matters, including the long-term consequences of their decisions and the interests of the company's employees and its commercial uh, business relationships, its, its suppliers, its customers, its creditors. Directors therefore are going to have to perform a very difficult balancing act between the short term decisions they need to protect the business, including perhaps prioritising critical payments over non essential ones, protecting the workforce, and these may have potentially a short term um, impact on the company's financial and trading position. The other point that directors need to be aware of is that in addition to those obligations, where the solvency of the company is in doubt, where there's a risk of insolvency in terms either of the company having a shortfall of assets against liabilities, or more likely in the short term, simply not being able to pay its debts as they fall due, the directors have an additional supervening obligation to look after the interests of creditors. Now, you may have heard that the government announced very, very recently um, at the weekend that they were planning to suspend the rules relating to wrongful trading in the UK and also to bring in some form of moratorium to help with creditor pressure. Um, on, on the suspension of wrongful trading, that's obviously helpful because in the UK we have a principle that if the directors of a company continue to trade beyond the point where they knew or ought to have known um, that the company had no reasonable prospect of avoiding insolvency, then if they continue to trade and incur credit, they may be subsequently found to be personally liable for that additional credit. Now, under the new uh, rules announced by the government, uh, and this is going to be backdated to the 1st of March, the principle is going to be that wrongful trading itself will not apply, so directors may be able to carry on trading even where it could well be said, and probably is the case for very many companies, that they're either insolvent now or very likely to become insolvent. So it does help directors in the decision to continue trading. However, and this is the but, and it's a big but, all the other rules about trading while insolvent remain in place. So fraudulent trading, where directors incur credit knowing, actually knowing that it won't be repaid or, or recklessly without any regard to whether it can be repaid. Um, that's fraudulent trading and uh, directors may be personally liable and indeed potentially criminally liable for that. Also, rules about uh, transactions at an undervalue, selling assets at an undervalue to connected parties, um, preferring one creditor over the other, um, all those rules will still apply and so directors still need to be very careful in discharging their duties in these difficult times and the, the, the changes announced do not completely remove 
all the obligations directors have to creditors. With regard to the proposed moratorium, we, we don't know any detail yet. Like much of what the government's doing, they're doing it in a very fast moving environment, not quite making it up as they go along, but certainly trying to adapt as things develop. And so what they're talking about are two types of moratorium. The first is a general moratorium through a fairly formal scheme, uh, which has been talked about for some time, and they're talking about bringing this forward. Now, we don't yet know when they'll be able to do this, because of course Parliament's not currently sitting. And secondly, because it's quite, um, there is a procedural aspect to it, we don't yet know how many companies will be able to take advantage of this. The other is a specific COVID-19 moratorium, which will be far more um, process light, if you like. It will be far, far easier to bring into play. And this will provide some protection to companies from creditor pressure uh, without the need to go into a, a formal insolvency process. And although we've heard of a few uh, high level cases, obviously Royal Ashley, um, Flybe, the regional airline and, and companies like that, which have gone into formal administration, probably because of, of COVID, but, but there are other reasons as well, almost certainly. We're not anticipating that vast numbers of companies are going to go into formal insolvency procedures immediately. More likely, they're going to try and mock ball, they're going to try and close down their operations, they're going to try and furlough their staff, but in some way, they're going to try and survive, they're going to try and avoid an insolvency process and be ready to start trading again once things start to improve. And so these moratorium procedures may help, but we don't know the detail yet. So what can directors do? Um, you know, what are the things that directors need to focus on um, in the meantime to make sure they do discharge their, their duties properly? And it's very important that they do this because clearly at the moment, Everybody's trying to do their best in very difficult, very fast moving circumstances. But when the dust settles after all of this, uh, people will be looking back to see what people have done, to see whether they've abused the situation. And, and certainly there will be some fraud, there'll be some, some, some really bad behaviour around, and, and, and those directors will be brought to book. But if directors act reasonably and prudently in, in the current circumstances and do their honest best to um, uh, abide by their duties and to fulfil their duties, it's very unlikely the courts are going to be receptive to any attempt to criticise or penalise honest, hard-working directors who've done their best in the circumstances. So some practical things which directors should focus on. First of all, good governance. Hold regular board meetings and, and have collective decision-making because it will tend to lead to better decisions. Don't treat this as a formality. It's, it's a valuable process. Base your decisions on factual evidence, on up-to-date forecasts, and keep reviewing the position. Circumstances are changing very fast. None of us thought three weeks ago we'd be in this position, I'm sure. And so keep reviewing your decisions in the light of changing circumstances. Directors need to be aware of the available support. So things like the furlough scheme, the VAT and tax deferrals that are available, uh, the business loans which may be available supported by the government. Um, and there's a lot of doubt as to whether they're, they are compre comprehensive, whether they're going to be available to companies on terms they can take advantage of, but certainly directors need to be aware of all these things and look to take advantage of those things which are appropriate for their business to help the business continue or at least to put it in a position where it can stand still and await the, um, the end of the current situation. One thing directors do need to do um, is to engage with other stakeholders, with suppliers, with creditors, with customers, with pension trustees, if you've got pension liabilities, and other stakeholders in the business. At this stage, the government has not, apart from one or two exceptions around um, Rental, rental property, protecting people from eviction, things like that. They're not yet intervening in private um, contractual arrangements. And Jonathan's already mentioned that the furlough scheme doesn't override um, basic employment law principles. So where directors need to reach accommodation with people, maybe to defer payments, to defer rent payments, for example, or to delay deliveries, 
things of this nature, um, they do need to engage with the other stakeholders because in many cases those stakeholders will have a mutual interest or at least some mutuality of interest in reaching some kind of agreed way forward because for many of those stakeholders the failure of your business will be a disaster as well. Um, insurance, make sure you know where you are with your insurance including your directors and officers insurance both in terms of any claims you may be able to make that it covers any of the losses you're suffering, but also to make sure that you keep the right level of insurance in place to protect your business and your employees. And then finally, um, audit trail, keep a record, keep minutes of your meetings, keep records of the decisions you make and the reasons why you take those decisions and the facts you've taken into account in doing so. All this will help you, should it be necessary at a later date, to demonstrate why you did what you did, why what you did was a reasonable, honest and prudent thing for a director to do. And that should help protect against any criticism in the future. And then finally, and, and you might say, I would say this, wouldn't I, do take professional advice, whether that's from lawyers, whether it's from accountants or, or any other relevant professionals, because in discharging your duties as directors, taking and acting on proper professional advice is the right thing to be doing and will help you demonstrate that you've done and you've tried to do the right thing in very difficult circumstances. Looking forward, um, we, we're going to have a lot of challenges even when we come out of this, so do keep reviewing things and starting to plan ahead so far as you can. Do remember that if you defer creditors, if you defer rent or VAT or DAYE, um, you will have to pay that. So there will be a wave of creditors to be met with an increased level of working capital needed in the business, both for meeting those deferred creditors, but also to finance any improved trading once things start to get back to normal. And, and bear in mind that when we come out of this a lot of businesses will be stressed a lot of businesses will be risking over trading and so you may have increased risk of your your, your counterparties the people you trade with failing on you so you need to factor that into your risk planning as well um, also rebuilding relationships a lot of relationships will be strained during this period so start to think about how you'll rebuild relationships in the new world going forward because that will be the key to transitioning successfully out of the current crisis. Don't make assumptions. Keep checking what you think is going on with the facts as, as they present themselves because at the moment the one thing we know is any assumptions we make are likely to prove to be incorrect. I'm sure there'll be some opportunities coming out of all of this um, so good luck and I hope this has helped give some kind of route map for what you should be doing in the current circumstances. All right, thank you so much, Jonathan, Amber and Julian for, for your presentations. Um, hopefully everybody's really enjoyed those. Um, we've got a few questions that have come in. Um, just as a reminder to all the, the, the attendees, um, if you have any questions, please write them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, um, not in the chat box. I saw at least one question come in through the chat box. So if you could just copy paste that into the Q&A so we can, we can go through them all. Um, but let's just get into the question. So the first one that we got um, is, can directors be furloughed? And if so, how are they supposed to comply with fulfilling their directoral duties if, they are not, if they're not supposed to work to benefit the business during the furlough time? Right, I'll I'll pick that one to uh, start, and then perhaps um, Julian can can comment. <clears throat> the general uh, view is that directors who are employees can be furloughed as employees, but to the extent they need to exercise their directoral duties, um, now. Uh, I think this is one which is clearly open to abuse um, in the sense that if a director continues to do pretty much absolutely everything they were doing um, before, then uh, query the extent to which they can 
split out their employee and their, their director role. But in terms of uh, complying, for example, with the, the duties that, that Julian has, has just set out, then there's no reason at all why they can't be uh, furloughed as employees, um, continue to take uh, their uh, cash and deal with uh, the issues that they've, they've got to deal with because uh, otherwise, Julian, as you've made it clear, bad things might happen. Yes, thank you, Jonathan. I think it's absolutely right that you need to be very clear that in, under English law, directors of companies wear two hats. One is as an officer of the company, and that's where their director's duties arise, and the other is as an employee. So even if on furlough as an employee, directors still have to discharge their duties as officers. Now, in practice, I think it's likely to give rise to quite a few problems. And, and it may well be that for many businesses, they will need to find a way of paying their directors to carry on working as employees as well as directors, as duty officers, because the, the things they will need to do um, um, to keep business going and to look after the employees, the customers, the suppliers, the creditors may take more than just simply discharging their statutory duties. Um, and that's, I think, one of the things directors of companies will need to think about is do the directors need to carry on being employed and not furloughed in order to keep the business together? And, and, and if so, how much should they be paid? And that will depend partly on what the business can afford. Um, so, yeah, be very clear about the fact that there are different duties for directors as officers than, than the things they do as employees. Okay, great, thanks. And um, then the next question um, came in directly um, for Jonathan, and it was, um, can you recall people and furlough early? And if yes, what are the implications on that to the employee vis-a-vis -vis HMRC slash government furlough agreement? Well, this goes back to what I was saying about making sure that you've got this uh, button down in your furlough agreement with the employee. You can recall people on furlough early, but bear in mind that uh, furlough has to be for the minimum of, 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 of three weeks. So if you're recalling them from under that period, then you're unlikely to be able to claim back from the government for any of it. Uh, it won't count as a furlough. Once you've gone after the three weeks, then uh, you uh, can call them back without affecting your compensation payment but make sure that you have agreed with the employee that that's what you can do uh, otherwise you might find uh, employees who are uh, uh, spending their time in different parts of the country who won't be able to get into work etc etc so you'll want to have sorted that out before the whole thing starts okay thanks and um next up um, we had, can a director be criticised under insolvency legislation for refusing to take up a loan under the government scheme if she or he doesn't want to give a personal guarantee to the bank to support the loan, i.e. can she or he put his or her interests in front of the company's interests? Um, well, thank you. That's a very good question. And there, there are a lot of big questions around the government loan schemes. Um, but, but on this particular one, there's been a lot of talk in the press about this. I don't think the government intended that people should give personal guarantees and of course they've, they've actually specifically provided that the, 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 the banks cannot ask for security over the director's own homes, their, their private residences. Although by taking a personal guarantee of course, a bank could indirectly get to the, the director's home because the director might need to sell their home to pay off a personal guarantee. The, the short answer to this very good question is no, a director does not have to give a personal guarantee. And if the condition of the loan is that they give a personal guarantee, they cannot be criticised um, for not doing it because they have no obligation under English law to put their personal assets on the line to support the business. The other thing is I think directors need to think about when looking at these loans is not only do they have to give a personal guarantee, but can the business afford it? Because of course these are not grants, they are loans. And basically the government is inviting, with its support, inviting directors 
to borrow money to cover losses caused by COVID um, and then repay it out of future profits. Now, some big companies may be able to afford that, but a lot of small companies may well say, actually, we're never going to be able to afford to repay this loan. Even though it's guaranteed by the government, it will be a, a liability of the company. And therefore, we shouldn't be taking the loan for these purposes because the company can't sustain it. And actually, it's not a discharge of the director's duties to take a loan. They can't um, see any prospect of being able to repay. Um, at the other extreme, of course, small businesses may say, well, even if we think we might be able to repay this over the next few years, why should we bother? Why should we work for the next few years to um, pay off a loan that's been taken out um, due to circumstances outside our control? And I think these are very good questions and uh, illustrate some of the um, problems that lie at the heart of what the government is trying to do in trying to protect the economy and yet find ways of making business pay the cost of doing so. So there are some big issues here. Thank you for, for that answer. And um, the next one um, I think I missed just before um, was, I think it came in during Jonathan's presentation and it was, are you saying that workers can, workers can get paid work elsewhere during furlough or are you talking about furloughed workers doing unpaid, i.e. voluntary work for the NHS or the police? I think the position in uh, relation to Uh, there's no issue there as far as the scheme is concerned. Uh, HMRC don't mind if employees are doing voluntary work. As far as the position is between employer and employee, again, I come back to the, the furlough agreement. If you're, uh, um, it's okay for your employees to volunteer, then you should say so. Uh, but also make it clear that you can call them back um, if that's what you anticipate um, that you're going to need to do so that your employees haven't made uh, commitments elsewhere that it will be both practically and legally difficult to ask them to break. As far as paid work is concerned, um, it's absolutely clear you can't do paid work for the employer during furlough. Um, it isn't clear whether you can do paid work for someone else. It doesn't appear to be expressly prohibited in the guidance, uh, although the, the, there is an ambiguity there and that's why our advice is uh, the starting point should be for an employee on furlough is you can't work for anybody else um, if you want to work for anybody else you need to ask us and get our consent and we need to be able to call you back and employers can take a view on that on a case-by-case -case basis of how much risk they are willing to bear the example i gave of the, of the airport where it was it was quite clear that it's an advantage to society at the moment if employees who are already um, uh, checked for uh, criminal records can go and work for the police who are who are uh, uh, short of people working for them at the moment. Um, so that employer we are encouraging to take a view in those particular circumstances, but other employers will take different views. All right, thank you. And um, the next one is a bit of a longer question. Um, as a specific, as a small independent school, kindergarten and creche, um, the early year setting is open to all, but we have furloughed all our staff as we are closed. We have school staff who would like on a completely voluntary basis, contact their children via agreed emails and contacts. They want to choose if and when and likewise it would be voluntary for the children's point of view as we're not charging fees. Is this allowed under furlough as it would definitely not be generating any revenue, but would it be classed as providing a service? Um, this would be to the children rather than a service to the business. Hmm. Um, uh, you know how it's said that any lawyer can answer any question with the words, it depends. Um, and as a lawyer, you have to be careful of that. You, you know, you can be asked the question, does my bum look big in this? And if you reply, it depends. 
you to answer this question without starting off, it depends. Um, the principle is that they can't do any work for you, the kindergarten. Um, however, if it looks like that work is carrying on by other means, so they are in fact working with the children but being paid privately, then uh, I can see that HMRC might look to challenge that because really what's gone on here is in effect the kindergarten acting simply as an agency for the introduction of the provision of teaching services to the children. Now, clearly, if the kindergarten isn't making any money out of that, um, then that's quite a hard one for the revenue to put. But but where you've got you know, owners of the kindergarten who might also be doing this, then it's going to get a bit a bit tricky. What I wouldn't want to, to say, because it would be a harsh thing to say, particularly in a kindergarten context where children are you know in isolation and this is difficult enough for them, for to say no you mustn't contact the children you mustn't have any contact with them stay away because that doesn't seem fair on the children or, or really that fair on the teachers either so so what i would say i think is is this um if there's any question of the teachers getting paid work from the the children's families then uh for the sake of the the, the furlough the kindergarten make or to make it clear that uh, um, there is to be no payment from the family in these circumstances on a on a private basis um, and uh, to advise um, uh, the uh, members of staff that uh, they can have uh, limited contact uh, with the children um, but they should use their discretion and uh, ensure that that doesn't tip over into providing uh, effectively a virtual childcare service. Thank you. Um, we've still got about three questions. We've got also about three minutes, so maybe we can see if we can um, quickly answer all of these or then um, at least a couple. Um, one of our employees has been furloughed. We ask all employees to check in each morning to state they're healthy or not, and either either working from home or relaxing at home. I would still like her to do this to make sure she's okay. I presume, I presume this is fine and ideally I would like to compel her to do this as I want to make sure she is okay. Okay, uh, short answer, no you can't compel uh, and it's not fine, it's a bit risky actually. All right, um, can a sole director be furloughed? Uh, I'd refer you to the answer that, that, that Julian and I gave later. There's a distinct uh, earlier on, um, distinction between employers, uh, uh, sorry, between an individual's um, role as an employee and their duties as a as a as a director. So, a a, a sole director can, in principle, be furloughed, um, uh, and it needs careful management in practice. Julian, would would you like to add to that? Uh, well, yes and no. I mean, in a sense, you, you've answered the question, but it is down to this issue of working out what is carrying out statutory duties as an officer of the company and what is carrying out duties as an employee. And I think the danger here, of course, is that a sole director is furloughed and gets paid under the, um, the government scheme, and then subsequently HMRC come along and say, well, actually, We've had a look at what was going on and you were actually working through this and um you know um you shouldn't have claimed under the scheme and there's always a risk of that i'm afraid but theoretically carrying out purely statutory duties would not amount to um, breach of the furlough um but if if the, if the the director is actually carrying out things which are not statutory duties but are part of their contract of employment then it's it's not furloughed. All right, thank you. And um, maybe we'll just really quickly um, go through the last question as well, and then we will be finished. Um, bearing in mind the furlough scheme is supposed to be there to prevent employers having to make redundancies, do you think there is a risk of HMRC declining to pay if entirely profitable employers 
whose business isn't affected, but who might have employees whose jobs can't be done from home, decide to furlough employees, even though in reality, they would not have considered redundancies. Okay, I can answer this one quickly, you'll be pleased to hear. If the business isn't affected by COVID-19, then you're not entitled to put people on furlough. That is the test. The business has to be adversely affected by, by COVID-19. Now that's quite broad. Um, uh, the, 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 the test doesn't go on to say, so that you have to make redundancies. It, um, HMRC haven't set the hurdle very high at all, but for businesses who are not affected by COVID-19, uh, and, and there are businesses, of course, who are uh, 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 not adversely affected. They, they, um, they're seeing more work at the moment, an increase in demand. Um, they are not able to put people on furlough. All right. Thank you so much. Um, hopefully we've now answered everybody's questions. Um, and hopefully you've all enjoyed it. Thank you so much again, Jonathan, Amber and Julian for all your presentations and answers to the questions. And um, I think that's all from us.